How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Monday on the show. You know what that means? We have a lot to talk about here today. This was a very busy weekend. I didn't have a Dave show until Sunday, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to not watch anything Friday. I'll watch everything Saturday and Sunday. So I started watching Collision, and then I had to watch Rampage, and then I figured I'll watch some more stuff on Sunday. Then I remembered New Japan was uh, was Sunday. And then I learned that the uh, New Japan main event alone was one hour and four minutes long. So anyway, got a lot of shows to talk about. We got Rampage, we got Collision, we got SmackDown, we got New Japan... Talk all about that uh, big main event and the Brian Danielson Zack Saber Jr. match, which was quite awesome. Also got the Raw lineup for today. Got some matches announced for Raw, including Elimination at Chamber matches. Got to talk about the Rock Roman Reigns. We got AEW Dynamite on Wednesday with some big matches leading up to their next pay per view NXT tomorrow, and of course a lot of news. We'll talk about Billy Jack Haynes when we come back from the break. And uh, also, we have some good news. We had a uh, 15-year-old high school student, Brian Pillman's grandson, Lexus King's nephew, helped stop a planned mass casualty event recently. So we'll tell you about that, as well as Brian Danielson, Zack Sabre Jr. 3, New Japan, New Beginning and Sapporo lineups. We've got Tony Khan talking Kenny Omega. Next week's collision preempted. There's so much news to get into here today. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. At Brian Alvarez on X. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. It's all helpful, friendly stuff. And I remember there was one point in the tape where I was I was telling him something about how one of his moves looked really good. I can't remember what it was. Probably the pump handle slam. And for some reason, he just snapped. And I remember he took all of his papers and he threw them up in the air, making a huge mess, which of course later he would have to clean up. And then he stormed off to his room. And I remember getting up and walking over and pounding on the door, asking him to come out, and he just refused. And I have no idea what the problem was. I can't explain it. Day after day after day, I waited. He wouldn't come out for anything. Not even to make my beef taquitos, which he's required to make each evening. And so finally, on the fourth day, he still did not come out. He still wouldn't respond to uh, my constant pounding or anything. And so at that point, I knew that I was going to have to do the one thing that that I just did not want to do. And so I did it. I made the hardest phone call I've ever had to make. Man, that's weird. Where'd they put him? (laughs) You better come with me. Green Hill School for Wayward Youths. Youth? Isn't Vince 27? The uh, doctors don't know how long it could be. It could be weeks, months, years. Poor shoulders. I just hope that when he gets out, he's the same shoulders he was when he went in, you know?
In the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. What a week. I think that's every week. But this is definitely what a week. So on Thursday, multi-hour standoff. Former WWE wrestler and Portland, Oregon standout Billy Jack Haynes was confirmed Saturday as a suspect arrested in the fatal shooting of his wife, Jeanette B. Craft. Early reports had the 70-year-old Haynes simply identified as, quote, a former wrestler. Although apparently there were, uh, you know, television news stories, and they just showed him right there. It's Billy Jack Haynes. But they did not name him in the press until Saturday. Same reports had Haynes uncooperative, prompting a shelter-in-place order for the surrounding neighborhood, 6,000 East 100th Avenue in Portland. Police called to the re- uh, residence, 10 a.m. local, following reports of gunfire. Eventually, local authorities got Haynes to come out into police custody in a local hospital where he remains, as of this writing, being treated on an unrelated medical condition. So once he's released from the hospital, which may be days from now, he's expected to be booked in a jail. His charges will be released once he is booked. So, B-Craft talked about this yesterday on Observer Radio. Billy Jack Haynes had a uh, best friend who he'd actually known for decades. And his best friend, I believe his name was Todd, was, uh, was also a wrestler. And years ago when they had the Portland Wrestling Reboot, uh, Todd was one of the wrestlers there. And uh, he, I believe, was on the very last Portland Wrestling Reboot television show in a tag team title match. And Billy had known him for years and years and years. And he was a power lifter, big jacked up guy. And he died last year, last summer. And after he died, Billy Jack married his mother. And so Billy Jack was 70 and his wife was 85. And uh, that is the victim. And I think more is going to come out in the next couple of days. But knowing that, you might be able to tie some stuff together as to uh, as to what happened here or what is alleged to what happened or what uh, Billy Jack told authorities. But uh, but anyway, he uh, he was definitely a weird guy, Billy Jack. And he'd done a lot of interviews, shoot interviews and. Kind of one of those guys that people are like, wow, that's kind of a weird sort of guy. But as usual in these cases, you know, there's a lot of weird guys that do weird shoot interviews and they don't kill anybody, allegedly. So anyway, that's uh, the Billy Jack story. Horrible story. And uh, I'm sure more is going to come out in a few days when he is released from the hospital. Anything you'd like to add, Mike? Not particularly, no. Uh, when it comes to that story, obviously it took some time for the police to come out and name not only the victim, but also Billy Jack Haynes as the one that did the shooting in all of the media leading into Saturday. It did mention that a professional wrestler lived there. Our own Jim Valley on his X slash Twitter did note that even though they have not said it, he believed it to be. For surely said that it was Billy Jack Haynes because obviously being tied into the the scene up there and the history of it, he obviously knew where Billy Jack Haynes lived. So I guess the details on what the delay was and what Haynes is suffering from right now, which is causing him to be in the hospital and all of the sordid details will probably continue to come out and I guess we can cross that bridge when we come to it then, but a just a tragic, sad situation. Jackson Swollen, however, is a hero, 15-year-old high school student, goes by the name Boom, Brian Pillman's grandson, Lexus King's nephew. The Uvalde Foundation for Kids have announced he will receive its National Student Hero Award for helping stop a planned mass casualty event at Marymount Heinz High School in Cincinnati recently. 14-year-old student has been charged with conspiracy to commit aggravated murder in relation to the case. Student is said to have conspired with an out-of-state adult believed to be around 22-24. Authorities have referred to the case as, quote, a credible plot to harm students and staff. 
Student is said to have had access to a weapon in their home, a kill list of eight students and one teacher. Upon learning of the plan, Swollen notified his father, despite having been threatened by the student not to tell anyone. His father quickly notified police. The kid had the firearms, a very elaborate plan, had every intention of carrying out the plan. My son, Swollen's father, said he does not lie. He's very literal. I could tell by his tone. And it was told to my son that if he disclosed anything about the plan to anybody, he would be shot and killed. But my son literally told me he didn't care if he got killed as long as he could protect his classmates. So uh, King went on social media, said he was proud of his nephew. My daughter, uh, what did he say here? Anyway, he's very proud of him. And uh, it's always good to hear a story that could have gone horribly wrong have a happy ending. So uh, congratulations to... Uh, Jack Swallen and uh, Brian Pillman Jr. has more to say about it on X. If you want to go there, check that out. But always good to have a good story in wrestling because we proud. don't always have those. Well, a very courageous thing to do, too. What a courageous kid, you know, under those types of threats that sound like they were very, very real. And a, I mean, again, what a disgusting, awful story. You know, especially knowing from what it seems like these weren't idle threats. This kid was willing to carry this stuff out. So, yeah, it's a silver lining, but also what a disgusting cloud that is, too. Just, again, uh, just awful. But, yes, thank God that this kid actually did step up and say something, regardless of who he is related to, to have that kind of courage. And hopefully that other kids, anybody else that hears this, you know, understands that, regardless you let somebody know because regardless of what you personally think of the threat level if you think somebody is just blowing smoke or if you are really scared you've got to say something because it could not only save your life it could save again you know dozens if not hundreds of others well then we had the big new japan show and uh hmm well first off that zach saber jr brian danielson match was awesome Although, uh, this Brian Danielson, this guy is a sadistic, crazy maniac. Which, by the way, his friends say as well. He went in there and he beat the crap out of this poor guy. He kicked him so hard in the head, kicked him so hard in the former chicken chest. Thank God that guy's jacked now. They had a great technical battle, back and forth, incredible storytelling. And at the end of the day, Brian Danielson won that first match with a strike. Zack Sabre Jr. won the second match with a crucifix cradle. But neither man has pinned the other. So where's it happening? Forbidden door? Wait, what? Neither man has pinned the other? No, submitted. There's right. been no submission yet. So uh, Brian wants best of three. And the people have speculated Forbidden Door. They've speculated Wembley. And, uh, you know, me personally, I say do it at Forbidden Door because I want Wembley to be that clam digger, Brian Danielson versus Nigel McGuinness. That's what I want that match to be. I don't know if that's what it's going to be, but they have uh, they built that one up for a while. Neutral ground? Neutral ground would be Forbidden Door because that's a joint pay-per-view. They better be doing that match with Nigel because he is way too over the top, I think, as a heel commentator. I think I have complained about that maybe when Filthy has been here. I think it is too much. And if you're not going to do a match with Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, then shut up about it because on commentary, that is what you're building towards. If you're not going to do it, stop talking about it. Stop being that way constantly on the mic. They have to do it. They have to. They have and I to. hope he, he's cleared, right? I mean, he would be cleared enough to do a safe match with, with Brian Danielson to save his... Well, hold on a second. That's the problem here. That. A <laughs> safe match with Brian Danielson. First off, you ever seen these guys wrestle each other? Yeah, I know. Second off, have you seen Brian wrestling now? I know. God. butts and, and whatnot. Lots of them back in the day. Too many of them. That's why they're in both are probably in the position they're in right now. Good God. Hmm. And then we had the, uh, we'll talk about Okada after the break, and we'll talk about the uh, main event, which I think is still happening right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> Back in a moment, Observer Live.
Green Hill. Hello. He's escaped. Do you know which way he was headed? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Shoulders. He's been here. It's Vinny straight jacket. We're getting close. Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Yeah, I tweeted about what I watched. You can go check it out on X. <laughs> Will Ospreay, Jeff Cobb, Hanare, TJP, and Francesco Akira. Whereas David Finley, Alex Coglin, Gabe Kidd, Clark Connors, Drew Maloney. What was billed as a War Games match? Which, I guess it was. I'm going to talk more about this with Tom today, <laughs> but suffice to say, the show went this this match, this match went one hour and four minutes. Which, ironically, for those of you who've been a website subscriber for a long time, remember one hour and four minutes? Crazy how things work in this life. <laughs> anyway, I would say. That uh, I'm not a fan of of like hardcore garbage wrestling and that sort of thing, but like no, if it's good, I, if it's good, I like it. And I would say that for, I'd say probably about 45 minutes, I was really liking this match. It was, uh, you know, it was. Hey, listen, if you're gonna do it, do it. <laughs> That's what I say. If you're gonna do it, do it. Mm. They did not half-ass this match at all. No. This is like that uh, that uh, Kenny Omega Moxley match. Remember that famous one? Where it's like, I hate that. But you know what? If you're going to do it, do it. Do and it. boy, did they do it. They did everything advertised and more. Well, this was a War Games match. And, uh, and these guys, my God. Just like, it was completely insane. It was completely insane. 
Hanare at one point got so busted open that like everyone was talking about how he, there's no way he can make it back into this match. And he came back. You ever seen those old Bugs Bunny cartoons where like Bugs Bunny has a toothache and they like wrap this thing around the top of his head and they tighten a knot right here. And it's like this giant. I mean, he looked like Tut. And he comes back and they let him continue. They let him keep wrestling. This giant thing on his head. And I'm just the blood everywhere. There's tax. There's barbed wire. There's blood everywhere from everybody. There's a Filipino demon. I mean, we got it all. <laughs> and then, you know, it like it reaches this this peak. I felt about forty, forty five minutes. And unfortunately, I knew how long the match went. So when it reached that peak, and I realized we've still got twenty more minutes, I was like, how? What? And so I keep watching it. And, uh, and you know, hey, some people liked it. I had people emailing me saying, how could anybody not like it? Well, it's easy because it was too long and they killed the crowd. They start taking that ring apart there at the end. And this crowd, which had been hot, hot, they died. And it took them forever to tear this ring apart because they wanted to do some spots on wood. But unfortunately, I don't know how they make these damn rings. But like in America, you can tear this stuff off and like the boards will stay put. Slam people on the boards or whatever. Well, in Japan, it was like it was like a piano. Boards are going up and down. Oh. And then they start falling apart. And like, dudes, this is not like a, a spot. It's like what actually happened. They're trying to do spots, but then they step through a hole and they fall. Like, guys ever read Rumpelstiltskin? You know what happened to that guy? He got so mad when they finally figured out his name that he stomped on the ground and he and he punched a hole in the ground and his foot went through the hole and he was ripped in two. Do you know that? That almost happened here in this match. So it was way too dangerous there at the end. And the most dangerous stuff where they literally could have been split in two from the ding-a-ling to the brain, no one cared. Dead crowd. And then finally it was all five of them against old Will Ospreay. He sent old Acura. I always say Akira, but it's Acura. They say, he sent him it's out to Acura. take the bullet for himself. Was that the first car you had? They called him Acura all night. Don't yell at me. How, how do you say his name again? Satan Full? Well, I, I, I say it a lot of different ways. I say, <laughs> yeah. that, I say it however I feel. It's my damn what, show. He was a maniac because he, he was a maniac. He took, he took a tombstone pile driver, and a lot of the match was about, to me, about him storyline wise. But he takes a, when all those boards are bouncing up and down, he was insane enough to take a tombstone pile driver. And I don't know why somebody decided, and I can't remember who gave it to him, if it was Maloney or who it was. But don't do that. When boards are going up and down and you have the ability to, like, plummet to your death underneath the ring, don't do that. Necks were nearly broken in that match. Yeah, they were. Been better if he would have got tombstone into a hole. So anyway, it was Osprey's the last guy there. He got killed. Yep. Trash panned on a barbed wire leg. Pinned. He's out of there. Oh, man. That was exhausting. It like, was, literally, as much. a viewer, I think I may have been as exhausted as maybe uh, probably TJP because he was under the ring for half the match putting on makeup. I mean, it was, hey, I love the first 45 minutes. He's, Don't he's get me wrong. He's got a thing going here, folks, for people who are wondering what the hell is going on. He is transforming himself recently uh, into a demon, yes. Yeah. Very muda like And here's the thing with this match. When you don't do these things that often and you're throwing literally everything out there for this one big gimmick, gimmick match that you almost never do. I mean, they're rarely inside a cage, almost never, let alone to have a war game style uh, match with a bunch of plunder involved in it. You don't know when to cut it off. You don't know what your limitations are. And I think that's the biggest problem. I, I think the intention was good and much of it was excellently done for the battle that they've been telling because that's what in the first part of the year this has been their best storyline has been the united empire battling bullet club knowing that finley is being built up and that osprey is on his way out of the company so i thought they pulled a lot of that off really well but yeah it did go on if you're going to watch this you're going to have to invest some serious time into it and we had the uh, final match of uh okada and hiroshi tanahashi and 
I enjoyed it. Was it the best match they ever had? Not even close. No. Was it a playing the hits version of a good match? Yes. Yeah. People liked it a lot. What the hell else you want, huh? Maybe, maybe for Okada to lose, but you knew that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, Tanahashi's a... He's an exec. He's he's not a regular anymore. We got to be realistic too. here. Well, very classy send off for Okada. And honestly, you know, I don't know where he's going. He is not signed with AEW as of this moment. It's expected he will. But my guess is he's going to AEW because I would think if he were going to WWE, they'd have beat him. And the reason for that is because I, yeah, right. If he goes, well, you may be right. But the point is, if he's going to AEW, he can come back here anytime. There's no point beating the guy on the way out. He's gonna be he's gonna be doing New Japan stuff in June, and you know Daniel Bryan's there right now for crying out loud, Bryan yeah, Danielson. But, where's the, but, where's but the if he goes to Bryan WWE, Bryan? he ain't coming back anytime in the next five years. Well, Nakamura didn't either, and Okada. If he wasn't, this has been now multiple matches since everybody's known that he's got a foot out the door, and they have not bothered at all, even trying. So, you know whether that is. Everybody just kind of going, eh, we'll just ride this like, you know, <laughs> go out the way you're going out. I'll be surprised. I've been very surprised they've gone with such a long exit tour, though. And it makes me think that he's going to end up with AEW. But it's kind of crazy that he's still going to have two more matches left after this one that happen to be in tag matches. Maybe he does take a L to somebody here, you know, along the way. But I, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. So that was the New Japan show, and that leads to a bunch of upcoming shows, including the actual final matches of Okada, which are multi-person matches. So if you're waiting for him to do some big singles job to somebody, well, he's not gonna. One of them is against United Empire, right? Well, we've got Okada, Ishii, Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yo versus Cobb, Great Okan, Hanare, Akira, and Colm Newman. I guess he could do a job to one of them. Not to Newman. And then we've got uh, his final, final match, for real this time. Okada, Tanahashi, Ishii, Goto, and Yoshihashi versus Matt Riddle, Jeff Cobb, Great Okan, Hanare, and Francesco Akira. Do the job to Riddle, I guess, if you're going to do one, because if Riddle is going to essentially take Osprey's place as the leader of that group, if that's the decision you decide to make, you can go ahead and have him lose the riddle, and then later on down the line at, at Forbidden Door or wherever else you'd want to do it, you could do that match again if you wanted to. An option. So that is uh, that's that. And you know what? If he happens to go to WWE if for fantasy booking the thing out, he loses to Riddle. Well, you got a guy that left WWE. You got him in, in New Japan, and he goes and loses to him. So you could, I don't know. There's ways that you could spin that if you wanted to. Collision preempted this coming Saturday. It will not air due to TNT's coverage of NBA All-Star Weekend. Show will air again in two weeks, February 24th. So no Collision. Coming up on Saturday night. I believe there's UFC that night, actually, if I recall correctly. It's a UFC every Saturday. But we did have a Collision show and a SmackDown show. And I watched the Rampage show as well, which, uh, man. You didn't watch CMLL? I did on, on Rampage. I watched Star <laughs> Jr. As Finge. And as Finge, the Finge. Phoenix. Rise from the ashes to do yet another job to the Blackpool Combat Club. Well, somebody had to. You guys notice Wheeler's not around? Uh-huh. That's making this whole thing difficult because Tony won't beat a star. And yeah. so we've got a CMLL. He'll beat, he'll beat Star Jr. we got a CMLL versus uh, Blackpool Combat Club feud that is absolutely, completely one-sided. The yeah. best we could get was Mystico beat someone who's not in the Blackpool Combat Club. But uh, they are assuredly, I would say... Going to do BCC versus CMLL in Arena Mexico here somewhat soon. And uh, I don't think uh, Blackpool's winning that one. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
drop. Sorry, Miss, you don't have your show yet. <laughs> That's it. Come here. The show Brian Elbert is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. All right. So the main event of WrestleMania is The Rock. No, it's not. It's Roman Reigns versus Cody. What are they going to do with The Rock? Well, The Rock is not wrestling in Australia, everybody. Not sure how many times I have to say that said that for months now. I believe that the night one main event is going to be The Rock and Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes. It is not confirmed, but I believe they're doing a takeoff on WrestleMania 1, and The Rock will play the role of Mr. T, the outside superstar. <laughs> yeah. And then night two will be Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes, and Cody Rhodes will finish his story. Now, how they get there, I guess we're going to find out. But I can tell you this. I pity the fans. I can tell you this. I don't know if this was their plan going in, but uh, Rock is going full heel. He's got Cody Crybaby shirts that are going to be available for sale, and he's going all in on this. And uh, and that tells me that I actually don't think that um, that this is going to be his last match. I think they're going to do Rock and Roman Reigns, maybe even next year at WrestleMania. So, uh, well, he's on the board now. We'll see. So, you know, you can have all the Dwayne washing you want, I guess, because this is his business now in between making movies, and we know how well that's gone for him. So, there's definitely going to be some sort of Roman Reigns Rock match because otherwise, how are we going to determine who the actual head of the table is? 
You know, will Appa and Sika weigh in on this? What will happen when it comes to the bloodline? So that whole story still needs to play itself out on top of or maybe even overshadowing whatever happens with Cody in his run at Roman Reigns, which is all about taking the universal slash world slash whatever heavyweight championship that his dad had in his hands at the garden and was pulled away from him, which was the reason that he was going after Roman Reigns, but then decided, no, I'm not going to do that, but then decided I am going to do that. And yeah. Prince here says the bookie makes so little sense. It's amazing, bro. Listen, knock it off. Okay. There was a time where the booking made absolutely no sense. I talked about it every week. Wait, wait a second. Hold on. You don't have to Hold be on. so indignant here. Hold on. Do I think that what they did with Cody on Friday where he stepped aside, that was, I'll say it flat out stupid, okay? Yeah. That was stupid. But the story they are telling now is not stupid. The reason you would do a tag match is because Cody buried the family. And Rock got very upset about that. You bury that guy's family, you're burying my family. He had a whole picture of the family tree. That's why he's angry. Oh, my God. Teal Margaret's going to come in and fight Nia Jax. It's going to be wild. Why is Cody facing Roman Reigns? Because he won the Royal Rumble. That makes sense. I'm I'm baffled at the Cody stepping aside part of it. That was stupid. But once they did the press conference and they told the story that Rock and Roman are family, and this Cody Rhodes, who, by the way, his his uh, music starts with there's only one royal family. Rock and Roman ain't going to stand for that. There's more we'll take there. you out. And then they had the big schmoz and, you know, this poor geek, Seth, who's just the geekiest geek that ever geeked. <laughs> I mean, God. You know, that was my, my <sighs> Seth laugh. I'm not going to get into his outfit. You can. You should. Get all the way into it. Go full Mr. Blackwell Brian Alvarez it's on a, that outfit. Tell him what you think about that sorry outfit that Roman Reigns said he stole from Becky. Talk well, about he, it. He may have. Here's the thing with that, that outfit. He had bows okay? on his shoes. You I, I get it. Okay? Famous people wear stupid stuff. Okay? I saw it at the Super Bowl, allegedly. But, uh, but here's the deal. Okay? They did that press conference, and... Roman Reigns is out there, and granted, he's just wearing a tracksuit, but, like, he's an athlete, dude. He looks like a million bucks. Behind him is The Rock, who's got his 80s action figure outfit on. He's got the tight pants and the tight tank top. He's got muscles out of his ears, just looking gigantic. All natural. Cody's out there. He's got his suit on, total pro. And then Seth is standing there in that absolutely stupid outfit with those stupid sunglasses and those stupid shoes. And that stupid jacket and the stupid pants. And he looks stupid. And like, how how can you look at these guys on stage and and not think, okay, we got three stars and then we got this clown. He how can you like not? He the carnival barker, not one of the main performers. He did. He looked like he should be, uh, you know, anybody want to go faster? Yeah. That's what he looked like. <laughs> now, if you think, oh, Brian, you know, you always say this. You're, you're an idiot. You're out of touch. Brother, between the outfit and the booking, nobody cares about Seth's belt. Nobody cares about Seth. They went on SmackDown, and they announced that uh, we got to talk about Seth. I'll, I'll just read it from the report right here. It was actually hilarious. It was it was completely hilarious. So it's the, the show opens, and... Uh, and we've got, uh, where's my SmackDown report? God, how many shows did I watch this weekend? Can't even keep track of this crap. All right, SmackDown. Hunter's in the ring with Adam Pearce and Nick Aldis. And he mentions it's definitely Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. And uh, crowd goes nuts. They're doing Cody chants. They're all into Cody. They're all into the match. And then he says, well, or Aldis says, now we have to talk about Seth Rollins and the world title. Absolute, complete, abject silence. There was no pop. There was no reaction. Nobody cared. And then he announces the uh, Elimination Chamber match and, and on and on. And it's like, he is... I mean, it's it's bad enough that he's portrayed as having a title no one wants. But on top of that, he out, he's out there looking like a complete and total clown. 
And it just drives me nuts. So, anyway. We'll get more uh, matches tonight to go to Elimination Chamber. We should do an angle where, like, if if Seth loses, he can't dress like an idiot anymore. He has to just, like, dress like a star. <laughs> like an actual star. Not a, not a fake Hollywood star that wears silly outfits. You know, there was a story of a basketball player because, you know, like in any athletic endeavor there's a lot of ribbing of rookies and newcomers that come along you know to welcome them into the the clan and everything and there was a story that there was one of the basketball players who dressed so poorly instead of like you know taking his suit out and and giving him some nasty clothes some tattered clothes to wear out as a rib they actually got the guy a really nice just plain suit and that was the rib was you actually have to you know dress like a human being for once and actually have something nice on and and formal that's what they should do for seth it should just be like a a pair of like basic air force ones you know just like some black track pants and you know a jacket or something like that just something completely different than what he is doing and what he is wearing and i guess i'm wrong i guess we're wrong because it seems to have worked as far as the ridiculous reactions that he gets but yeah i mean the optics when it comes to some of he and becky lynch's outfits i mean they certainly have have gone way past you know my definition of what fashion is uh but yeah you know, i guess to each their own got the usual thing going on in the chat you know aw fans wwe fans blah 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 the fact of the matter is there are things that wwe does that are great and there are things that they do that are stupid and there are things that aw does that are great and there are things that aw does that are stupid and i'm sorry i don't care what you think of the wrestlemania build the rankings are stupid, okay? And I got even more angry because I was really thinking about that that uh, Adam Copeland segment on Collision. Daniel Garcia. I, I got so mad I was thinking about it today because Adam Copeland is ranked number three and Daniel Garcia is not ranked at all. So Copeland gets interviewed and they're like, who do you want to face? You're ranked number three. What title do you want? So he's in the middle of explaining that he wants Christian's title. When Daniel Garcia comes out and he goes, you know, I've been winning a lot of matches too. I think I deserve that title. So the, the obvious thing is that Copeland should say, well, I'm sorry, I, I get to pick because I'm ranked third, you're not ranked. They asked me, like they literally asked me what, to, but instead Copeland gets mad and he goes, well, we'll have to square off to find out who gets him. And I thought, this is so stupid. And you know what it made me think about? It's stupid because there's a much better way to do this and it's much easier. And that is, you don't have rankings. Copeland wins a bunch of matches, which he's been doing. And then, last week, on Collision, in the main event, Daniel Garcia does not pin Nick Wayne, who never wins. He pins Christian. Then, when Copeland is interviewed about who do you want to face, and he brings up Christian, well, Garcia shows up and he says, brother, let me tell you something. I just pinned Christian last week, and I've been on a win streak. I deserve this match then it makes sense to actually book this match. And on top of that, the match is bigger because you've got Adam Copeland versus a guy who just beat Christian. That is bigger than Adam Copeland versus a guy who's gotten some wins over some guys, but also just went, you know, 0-5 and five or 1-6 and six or whatever in the Continental Classic, and the story was he can't get a win. So instead, now we've got this thing where the rankings have gotten in the way, and... The issue with the rankings, everybody, is not just that I think they suck, but it's a crutch, okay? The biggest issue with AEW booking is Tony Khan won't beat stars. He won't, okay? The BCC has not done one job to the CMLL guys, not one, because he's not going to beat Moxley, he's not going to beat Claudio, He's not going to beat Brian Danielson. The one guy he would beat is Wheeler, and he's not there. So therefore, BCC just keeps beating these guys. If he wasn't afraid to have Daniel Garcia beat Christian, well, then you can easily convince people that Garcia should get a championship match. Instead, he won't have him beat Christian. So instead, what happens is, well, you know, Daniel Garcia is going to win a bunch of nothing happened in matches, and uh, and he's going to get ranked. Same with the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks, 
they could just say, well, you know, they they destroyed Darby and, and Sting after they won the tag team titles. Darby and Sting are mad. We want you at the pay-per-view. Well, no, they can't do that because they have the rankings. So now the Young Bucks have to move up in the rankings. Are they going to move up in the rankings by beating, you know, big-name teams? No, they beat a nothing team on collision. And then they're going to beat, what was it, top flight? They're going to be top flight on Wednesday. And then, you know, whatever. And that's how they're going to get a championship match. Having Sting and Darby furious that they ruined their title celebration and demanding them in Sting's final match is a better story than the Young Bucks beat a bunch of nothing teams and now they're ranked number one and they're getting a championship match. The rankings aren't making it better. They're making it worse. And I like this show and I don't like a storytelling device that's making the show worse yeah it's a storytelling device that unfortunately can be used as a crutch and for me is just something that usually gets in the way way too much and this is a good example of it getting in the way if edge goes out as garcia confronts him and goes you're not in the rankings he looks like a heel saying that now he looked like a heel saying you're taking food off my table anyway but that's kind of a different story i looked at that as him kind of you know big time in the the younger guy right there saying you're not going to take this you know for me as opposed to a lot of people and how they're looking at it which is he's literally taking food out of the mouth of his wife and his children i mean it's some of the conversation around that has been kind of crazy to me but then again it wouldn't be wrestling banter if it, if it wasn't ridiculous. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
in the show. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB, also WrestlingObserver.com. All right, shows very quickly over the next couple of days. We've got Raw tonight. Liv Morgan, Zoe Stark, Elimination Chamber qualifying match. Jey Uso in the New Day versus Imperium. R-Truth versus JD. And I think uh, Bronson Reed qualifier as well. I actually don't have it in front of me. Then we've got NXT tomorrow. Tony D and Stax versus Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin for the tag titles. Carmelo Hayes and Joe Gacy. We've got uh, Ridge Holland versus Gallus in a gauntlet match. We have three women's matches, all involving new or green wrestlers. Lola Vice versus Tatum Paxley, Keanu James versus Brinley Reese, and Adriana Rizzo versus Jada Parker. Von Wagner and Mr. Stone versus Noam Darn Oro Mensa, and the return of Obafemi. That might be a rough show. And then for Dynamite, we have got Young Bucks versus Top Flight to race up the rankings. Adam Copeland, Daniel Garcia. Winner gets Christian, apparently. Sky Blue versus Willow Nightingale. We will hear from Hangman Page, Samoa Joe, and Swerve Strickland. And then Tony Storm's latest film premiere, Wet Ink. We had a question on the uh, chat. Who is the top babyface in AEW? And it occurred to me that the top babyface in AEW is a heel. It is yeah. Swerve Strickland. Of course it is. Yes. Yeah, with MJF not there, you know, no matter what you think about Samoa Joe or Swerve Strickland, they are the heels, as at least as it stands right now. We'll see what happens moving forward. Maybe Hangman, especially after the way last week went. Oh, Hangman's a heel. Guy. You kidding me? Not yet, but he's on the way. He's, he's definitely way. a heel. All right, we got to go. Hey, Tom's going to be up. We got a lot to talk about. Boy, do we ever. We got something special to talk about today. 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern, WrestlingObserver.com. That's it. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.